Okay, it's, it's real rise as the premier Shiite center of learning happened in the 20th century. In 1920, Ayatollah Abdul Karim al Ha'iri, who was, who was one of the major Ayatollahs and scholars in Najaf, dis and, and was Iranian, um, uh, uh, part Iranian uh, uh, by family background, decided that he wished to re establish the seminaries in Qom. And in 1920, he moved, personally moved him and his entourage. And that's not an insignificant number of people. An Ayatollah like that has a lot of uh, hangers on. And he takes them, when he takes them to, uh, to another city and sets up base there, it's a significant event. And he moved in 1920 uh, from Najaf to Qom. And lo and behold, his students develop, became great scholars in themselves. And they were based in Qom. And then other scholars were attracted to Qom. And Qom developed as the center which it is today throughout the, uh, throughout the 20th century um, until... Uh, during the period of Saddam Hussein, um, well, I suppose uh, before that, during the Ba'ath period more generally in, uh, in Iraq, uh, Najaf began to, its influence began to wane as, as, as Shiites became systematically excluded from power in Iraq. And, uh, and the seminary system in southern Iraq suffered under the, uh, under the uh, discrimination against the Shia during that period. And Najaf began to uh, wane as a center, and this was a great opportunity for Qom, which developed um, uh, um, uh, a real identity of its own during the 1950s, a bit, it, even more so during the 60s and 70s, such that it really overtook Najaf. And if we're talking about today, I mean, the, the seminary system in Qom is probably three or four times larger than the seminary system in Najaf. That doesn't stop the people in Najaf thinking that Qom is actually a rubbish place to study. If you want to do proper Shiite studies, you've got to be in Najaf. And it doesn't stop, and it doesn't stop the people in Qom lording over the people from Najaf to say, your system is just a, a shadow of its former glory. We are the uh, new kids on the block, uh, new kids in terms of the uh, length of Shiite history, and we're the ones that really control uh, the, that we are the powerhouse of, uh, of uh, Iranian intellectual and uh, Shiite intellectual development. So there's enormous rivalry between uh, Qom and Najaf in the, in, in the tradition which, uh, of all university cities. Uh, they always have to have a rival of some description, and uh, Najaf and Qom are, uh, are, um, are no exception. So uh, Abdul Karim Ha'iri from 1920 onwards develops Qom, invests enormously in Qom, and, and, and there is a, a series of great scholars after him, some of whom we'll, we'll meet on our tour, uh, or at least we'll, we'll meet their, 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 um, the, the record of their influence on the city of Qom uh, as we move across. As you move down from Tehran to Qom on this highway called the per Persian Gulf Highway, uh, which runs from Tehran all the way down to the Persian Gulf, um, you, uh, you travel through desert, quite um, remarkable uh, desert scenes and uh, very interesting geographical features of which I know absolutely nothing, but always, uh, always strike me as, uh, as, as, uh, as particularly um, uh, uh, beautiful as I, as, as, I, as I move from Tehran to Qom. Um, Tehran is around about 1,700 1, meters above sea level. Qom is around about a thousand, just under a thousand meters above sea level. So you're 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 going down about a, a, a thousand meters, around about uh, three thousand feet from Tehran down to Qom, and the 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 the, uh, the the climate is completely different. Qom is in the middle of a desert. Its water is uh, salty and brackish. Uh, everyone jokes about the quality of tea in Qom being very poor uh, because they make it with salty water. And, um, and as you approach Qom, you go past the Hausa Sultan on the, on the left-hand side of the highway, which is this huge salt lake, um, uh, in which, is, uh, which, is, um, which is about, which is just a huge expanse of land about that deep in, in crystal salt, which you can walk through and uh, covers your feet. It's, a, uh, it's, a, it's, an, it's an amazing uh, geological feature. But when you reach Qom, um, the place there where you want to um, move to first of all is the central area right in the middle of Qom, known as the Haram. 
which uh, thank goodness for Google Maps is all I can say. I was able to, uh, I was able to construct most of this, uh, this stuff. The, uh, the, in the middle where it says Hazrat Masume, Holy Shrine, that is known as the Haram. And that forms the central area of Qom. And the tour that I'm going to be taking you on um, uh, uh, will take us from the Haram, and I'll talk a little bit about the Haram, down this street to one of the major libraries called uh, the library of Ayatollah Marashi, uh, a very famous library. Then we'll um, come down here, down Mu'alem Street, to the house of Imam Khomeini. We'll go down to these crossroads here and look at one of the Imam Zadeh's, uh, a small shrine um, uh, dedicated to a descendant uh, or, uh, of, the, of one of the uh, 12 Imams. Then we'll come along uh, at Sumaya and Hafez, down here to this, the Jamiat Zahra. Jamiat Zahra is a huge women's uh, seminary uh, in, uh, in Qom. Uh, I'll take you to Mufid University just south. This is a very interesting institution which is a fusion of, uh, of uh, university system and seminary system and, uh, and uh, uh, be able to talk a bit about that. We'll return up here and go along Bolvar Amin. We'll stop just here where the red line stops and uh, show you one of the seminaries there and uh, we'll have a look at the Musalla Quds. I thought that was appropriate since we're in Jerusalem that we should see the Musalla Quds. Uh, we'll visit uh, one Ayatollah's uh, offices here and another Ayatollah's offices there, and I'll tell you a little bit about the Ayatollah's. A library here, and then we'll return to the, uh, to the, uh, to the Maidan, the central Maidan of the Haram, that meaning the, uh, the, uh, the square of the Haram. Uh, and um, I'll talk a little about the Hausa offices and the, the attempts to reform. And if we have time, I'll take you uh, out of the city, south to the... Um, to the Jamkaran Mosque uh, to give you a flavor of uh, just here, uh, the, a flavor of the, uh, of the, um, of the, uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, more fringe religious activities that are going on in Qom. So that's the tour. Uh, let's begin with the uh, uh, shrine of the uh, uh, Fatime Masume. This uh, is a shrine. Uh, it's been known as the burial place of Fatima. Uh, not Fatima, who was the daughter of the Prophet Muhammad, but Fatima, who was the daughter of the seventh Imam, uh, who died in Qom on her way to uh, visit her brother, uh, Ali Aridda, the uh, eighth uh, uh, Imam up in Mashhad, who uh, uh, was unwell, and she fell ill in Qom and uh, passed away there on the way up to Mashhad. Um, and uh, a shrine developed around her. And the shrine, the tomb itself, dates from around about the 13th century. The dome is Safavid, um, because, as I said, when the, during the Safavid period, that is from the 16th century onwards, much money was, was plowed into Qom, uh, and uh, uh, Shah Abbas II, one of the uh, uh, um, Safavid shahs, is buried in the, in the shrine itself. Um, and, uh, and so since uh, uh, the death of Masume, so that's um, early 9th century, um, 816, so since 816 when she died and was, and was buried there, this has been a center of pilgrimage. <coughs> the, the minarets are Qajar. That means that they're 19th century minarets. The dome is uh, Safavid and the tomb inside is 13th century. So you can see how it's grown over the centuries. And, uh, and uh, it received much money in the early 19th century. Uh, and uh, Fat Ali Shah, the first Shah of the Qajars, uh, who reigned from uh, 1794 up until 1835, uh, decided this is where he wanted to be buried. And his tomb is also inside the Haram area. Uh, so that's the, uh, that's the area of the Haram uh, in the center there. Um, another picture of the, uh, of the Haram courtyard there as you, uh, as you look through one of the gates uh, leading, into the, uh, leading into the Haram area. Uh, Non-Muslims are um, supposed not to uh, be permitted to enter the, uh, the Sahn, the courtyard of the Haram. But to be honest, it depends what day of the week you go and who happens to be the guard on the door because... Uh, Sometimes I've been turned away and sometimes I've been let in. Um, uh, and even when I've worn my scruffiest clothes, 
um, I've still been turned away and tried to blend in with the Iranian populace. I've still uh, been turned away. So it's, uh, it's, uh, there's no rhyme or reason to it, to be honest. Um, this is an aerial view of the, of the Haram, and it's, uh, it's uh, a fantastic complex, really. Um, just to run through, the Bourgerdi Library will be, re will be returning to at the end, but if we run through the, uh, the, um, the Haram itself, the Haram Dome, which is marked there, uh, the Sahan right in front of it with a fountain in the centre, this area, the new Mosalla to the left, uh, they, they've been expanding the... Uh, this used to be a courtyard, and it's now a covered area in Qom. Um, I think it's the most hideous thing ever, but they've, uh, they've built this huge mosalla next to the uh, prayer, prayer hall, next to the, uh, next to the, um, next to the haram, um, and, uh, and they've covered it over now, uh, covering over a courtyard. It's a bit disappointing in my view, but never mind. They don't really listen to my opinions. You'll be surprised to hear. Uh, Marashi Street uh, is the one which we're going to be going down in a minute. The Haram Treasury and Library, the Haram itself has a library, a very good library of manuscripts. It's a difficult library to access, particularly as a non-Muslim, since it's inside the shrine. So, you, so since non-Muslims are not allowed inside the shrine, it's a bit difficult to get access to the library. But theoretically, non-Muslims are allowed to use the library. But unless you parachute in, there's no means of getting there <laughs> unless you manage to get past the guards. So you have to have a whole number of, um, of special permissions before you can get to the to the library, but it's a particularly rich collection of, of, of manuscripts around about 12,000. It's a beautiful manuscript. The Masjid al Azam, just north of there, is the big blue dome, which you see on pictures of Qom. I don't know if that was on the, as if we go back. Yes, the big blue dome, well, uh, blue floral pattern dome. Uh, that was uh, built in the 1950s, um, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll see about that by, under the auspices of, uh, of Ayatollah Burujerdi, whose library is uh, just next to it as well. So if we leave the, uh, if we, if we leave the harams uh, and we come out into the Maidan, this, the square, that's the view you get from the Maidan. And just across from the Maidan there, the, you have the Sheikhan graveyard. And I'll just uh, introduce you to that because this is a good place to start. This is where two of the great founding intellectuals of Hadith scholarship, of, of, trans, of, of the transmission of the tales of the Prophet Muhammad and, um, his, uh, and, his, ima, and his successors, the Imams, are buried. Um, we have uh, Ali ibn Babuya. Those of you who know anything about Shiism, this isn't Sheikh Sadok, this is his father, but he's still an important Hadith commentator. So Ali ibn Babuya is, is buried there in the center, and, uh, uh, and uh, ibn Kulaywa, who is also buried there, and they have their, uh, and that's in the Sheikhan, the two Sheikhs uh, um, graveyard. The Sahne Haram. Um, which I mark there uh, uh, to give you an idea of the, of the distance that we will travel across the Maidan to that. This is what it looks like as you, as you approach it. I apologize for the, for the quality of some of the pictures on this. I, first of all, I'm not a great photographer. Secondly, I'm not particularly technologically sufficient. And when you put these two together and put a PowerPoint, the, the results cannot always be totally satisfactory. But I hope you get, get, you get the idea. As you approach the Sheikh Khan graveyard, you have graves and, and memorials on the outside of people. It's an expensive place to die, actually, Khom. Um, and an expensive place to be buried. It's a, it's a, it's a highly prized area uh, in, terms of the, uh, in terms of your fate in the next life if you, are man if you manage to be buried in Khom. So it's, it's, it's not cheap. Um, large numbers of people who were martyred in the uh, Iraq war are buried in Khom. Uh, uh, for, uh, because of the religious significance of their death. This is the only picture I could get of the inside, which I downloaded off the internet. I don't have a picture of, that I took myself, of the inside of the uh, Sheikhan uh, Maqbara, the, uh, area, the, um, the uh, grave site, uh, you might say. Um, and unfortunately, you've got um, uh, Ayatollah Khamenei in the foreground because it was taken during his visit to the Sheikh Khan. But I thought it was a good view of the uh, of the of the um, of the uh, of the tomb behind and inside that tomb there are there are two uh, grave uh, um, sarcophagi um, to the two sheikhs. Uh, coming out back into the Maidan where we are now on the right hand side you see the gold dome on the right hand side on the uh, street level you'll see a small blue archway. That is the entrance to the Faizia. The Faizia is the oldest and probably most important madrasa in, in Qom. Uh, uh, 
when you go in through that door, you go into a courtyard, uh, um, a courtyard with a fountain in the center, surrounded by um, uh, uh, sumptuous portals uh, 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 leading into study rooms behind. Uh, here's a picture of the uh, of the of the. Uh